Good morning, Leslie. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Annie? I'm well. It's a beautiful day. Fall is here and we're we're just carrying on as best we can. Yeah, well, you know, I'm often reflecting these days on how fortunate we are to be in a field that does translate to remote learning and, you know, online technology. Uh, we're certainly more fortunate than some other folks who, who really can't do their job unless they're physically present uh, for whatever it is they're doing. So, um, yeah. And it, it translates so well in particular with mm -hmm. some of the questions around yoga that were already arising before COVID. So, and I know that that's something that you and I have discussed. So, so sure. let's talk about yeah. that a little bit. What, how, how, how you can't do inappropriate touch uh, over <laughs> Zoom? <laughs> For one thing. <laughs> For one thing. Well, you can, still give, you can still give inappropriate cues over Zoom. So uh, certainly the touch element is, is not present, but um, the, the whole way we choose to communicate and how carefully we choose our words and uh, the, the whole um, idea of uh, translating uh, teaching language and methodology to this medium uh, is a really, really interesting topic. And it's something I've been giving obviously a lot of thought to uh, since, well, since April when I started up teaching uh, in an online um, way, uh, just, you know, with a tripod and a camera in the room and, and no one else. So uh, what I really love now, of course, is that uh, all of the um, teaching events we had for the fall, including yours, uh, which were supposed to be in person, um, have been moved to, to Zoom, but at least it's interactive. At least we can see each other's faces. At least we can have, you know, in exchange. Uh, what I find interesting also is, is how just the language of how we describe what we're doing has to change. Because, you know, last year, if I said I was teaching a live workshop, no one would have to question what that meant. It, it meant that I was going to be in a room with other people, breathing the same air, teaching a live workshop. Um, and now when you say live, you have to qualify. Do you mean live in person or live online? Uh, right. in real time um, is, is something that you've recorded in real time now being available for asynchronous viewing. So, you know, we have to actually use a few more distinctions these days to, to, to be clear about what environment we're in and how we're doing it. And isn't that so in keeping with the way of yoga? Like, for example, what does self mean? <laughs> right? uh -huh. What is breath? What does it mean? What does even, what does it mean that the world is real or not real? What does real mean? You know? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, well, you just jumped right down into the most crucial controversial philosophical issues for me just talking about semantics of teaching language, which is awesome. That's one of the things I love about you, Annie. Um, so, yeah. And it's in, also in, one of the things that drives people nuts about me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, for some people that's a shorter drive than others. Um, so, yeah, in real life, are we, are we exchanging ideas in real life right now. Um, for a lot of us, this is as real as it gets at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for those people that are promoting the idea that we're living inside some so sort of holographic simulation, you know, I, I think what's been going on lately has only added fuel to that way of thinking. Um, you know, but it does, it does bring up a, a question that arises fairly regularly when I'm, when I'm teaching because uh, my teacher, Desika Char, was actually really insistent on being clear on issues like that. Like, you know, when you use a term like yoga, 
for example, um, how you interpret it is very revealing. How you translate it, let alone interpret it, is very revealing as to what philosophical bias or tradition you, you may be uh, immersed in, you know, because um, when you translate yoga as union, okay, as opposed to yoga as joining, mm -hmm. you're actually, um, depending on which of those terms you use, sometimes without knowing it, you're promoting a particular view. For example, the, the yoga as union view is much more Vedantic um, in its origin uh, than yoga as joining or yuj, you know, to, um, to yoke together. Um, because that's a, that's, that's a view that's more consistent actually with yoga and Sankhya, which is the sort of underlying metaphysics of yoga, the yoga we find in Patanjali, yoga as a darshana as one of the classical systems is actually dualistic as is Sankhya. Uh, whereas Vedanta pretty much isn't, but there's like different like degrees of dualism, non-dualism within Vedanta. But what's most important to Vedanta is the one thing, Brahman. Then you just have to figure out where your individual existence um, is in relation to that. Um, and the ultimate goal is union with whatever that Brahman is. Uh, that's not really the same in, in yoga. So, so Desikachar was always reminding us um, to, uh, to keep the yoga um, clearly distinct from other views uh, that uh, may not agree with it um, and may sort of muddy the waters. And that goes to how, how you use words, how you use terminology, you know, like Jiva and Atman are not interchangeable terms, you know, nor is Ishvara and Brahman, right? Uh, so I, I got, I got kind of clobbered a few times in exchanges with him for, for not, uh, being as clear about these things as I should have been. So, yeah. So I, and, and, and those clobberings are so useful for our, for our evolution, right? Like we need to be clobbered sure. here and there. Oh, sh sure. Especially from a teacher who's not known for his sort of clobbering, you know. Um, exactly. If you're in the room with, if you're in the room with some other kinds of teachers, you kind of expect to get smacked. But with Desika Char, in the, on the very rare occasions where he would respond with that degree of uh, intensity, to something I, I said or did, it, it really, really got my attention. Because for the most part, is very laid back, very laissez-faire, very, you know, we'll just sit here and talk about the weather until you ask me an actual question that has to do with yoga. He had no agenda, really, mm. for, for me or for himself. Mm. You know, he taught from a very deep place of his own personal understanding and, 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 and you know, learning that he had received from his father. So he taught from that place, but not as it applied to him and not with any agenda that he understand things the way he did, but as it applied to me. And, and that context could only come from me. He couldn't give me that. He couldn't, um, you know, put some answer into me that wasn't a response to an actual genuine heartfelt question. And more often than not, what he came back with wasn't an answer at all. It was just another question. So he was very Socratic that way. And, and that shows up in your teaching so beautifully where you, where you, you give, you give <laughs> instructions, but I don't even think that's the right word for what you give. You give in you issue invitations and with mm -hmm. clear parameters and yeah. then and then it's an open field of inquiry for the person who's, who's accepting those invitations. Yes, and not everyone accepts. I mean, that's not for everyone. Not everyone likes that. You know, it, that makes some people anxious or angry or frustrated. Uh, and I understand that, you know, and it is this, this way of teaching and learning is really not for everyone. A lot of people really do want a lot more structure and they want to be told what to do and why they're doing it and have the laundry list of benefits on one side and contraindications on the other. 
and you know uh, require for their own set of boundaries or parameters or whatever to to have all of that. Now, I'm not against structure. Structure, you know, technique is structure. If you're teaching a technique, you're teaching something that's structured in some way. And and there is the possibility you'll get it wrong. You know, if you couldn't get a technique wrong, then there'd be no way of getting it right. So it wouldn't be a technique. It would be just, you know, go and do whatever you feel like, and that's fine. Um, so I do teach technique, but I, I contextualize it as here. This is the structure upon which we're going to hang our inquiry for now. You know, and the inquiry part is, is what you're describing mostly that it consists of questions like, what are you noticing? You know, do you, can you tell the difference between doing something this way and doing something that way? Or when you focus in this way, does your experience change? So that's the inquiry based aspect of, of what I teach. And the great thing about an inquiry is that there's no way to get it wrong. There is no wrong answer to an inquiry. Even if your answer is, I don't, I, I spaced out, I didn't hear the instruction, um, I'm confused, I don't know what I'm feeling. Those are all great responses to an inquiry. You know, as long as you're clear that you're confused, that's never a problem. Uh, it's when we're confused about being confused uh, that we have problems. That's avidya. You know, but recognizing confusion, according to Desik Achar, is itself a form of clarity. So, yeah, that's the great thing about inquiry is that it leaves a lot of space for people to have their own experience and to not make themselves wrong for not getting it. You know, but you have to have some technique to temper that. You have to have some structure. Because if you're teaching inquiry with no technique, you're just inducing chaos, you know. Um, and, and anarchy, and um, you need some structure. But on the other hand, if you're teaching technique without inquiry, you're just teaching dogma, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think we've had enough of that in our lives in some areas. So um, we really do need to find a balance in, as teachers, uh, knowing where we stand in the thing we're trying to communicate, just recognizing that these are like the stira and sukha of a learning environment. You need the space, as much as you need the boundaries and they rely on each other. If you were approached by a yoga student who mm. found themselves in a place of pretty profound discomfort mm. um, in, in, and I don't mean physical discomfort, although that might okay. also be part of it, but mm -hmm. just like, like um, that it's a scary place to mm. have boundaries that are that are large and um, and it's it there's there's so much uncertainty that they're that they feel like they're craving more more of that technique or only technique because it's too it's it's too mysterious to venture into the realms of of so much inquiry and and be perhaps what they are bound to notice if they did accept that invitation, they're not ready to face. What, what would you advise somebody like that? Hmm. Have I you ever I'm, been somebody like that? No. Have you no, ever been I in that haven't. place? I have you not haven't. been in that place. Oh, well, I've been in the place where, where, not that it's so much scary, but that I, I'm, well, probably it is underlying fear, but but in my, well, you, in my you, you, you described mind. it so you described it so beautifully. I'm kind of assuming that came from some kind of personal experience, <laughs> you know. Um, I've been I've I've had students. I've had many uh, students in that place, and I'm thinking I'm thinking about trauma, sure, a of history course. of trauma. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah. and because I. I have a theory that the that perhaps that type of student is is um, more attracted to the the more sort of dogmatic ways. I don't know that that that's just a loose mm. idea that I'm toying with, but that there could be such mm. benefit in in a in a, in a safe space that allows for some of that more open exploration. Um, sure, absolutely. I, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of ways to answer that, 
that inquiry. Of course, my first impulse was to say, well, what's your experience around that? Because um, that's all Desikachar did to me. You know, he'd just throw it back at me all the time. I'd come in with this massive confusion and, you know, really wanted some answers from him uh, to relieve my confusion. And he would come back with, well, if this is an important issue for you, what does your experience tell you? And it's like, there's nothing more frustrating than that in that moment when you just want the friggin' answer, you know, so you can feel better about something. Um, so that was my first impulse, like, hmm, let's, see, let's Desika char her right now. What, are, what does your experience tell you about this, Annie? And it makes me sound very, very wise, you know, if, if it works out. Um, <laughs> So, what, what I would say about that is um, trauma is interesting because on the one hand, it is kind of a special case that we need to deal with, that we need to be aware may be showing up in our classroom. In fact, the way we would deal with students like that, I think needs to be considered less of a special case. And let's just assume that yeah. at least one person and potentially many people, and why not just apply it to all the people in the classroom are gonna yeah. need to have a safe space to explore their confusion and a structured experience that allows them a way out of that. That is what I was just saying uh, earlier uh, of knowing as a teacher that you're dealing with uh, a, a, a balance between inquiry and technique, between stira and sukha. And so how does that look in practical terms? Well, for me, it's, it boils down to a few really simple principles. Uh, number one, invite people into experiences as you said that's that's very much the way i teach and that's just has to do with language like i'm going to invite you to come to your mat now um if you like or you can observe you know and come to this later in your own time right so even whether someone's participating or not is is kind of up to them and letting them know that they that they have a choice in any given situation and that they are exercising it um, is important because that's, that's agency. That's letting people know that they have agency. Now, as you were saying, as part of your question, some people don't want that much agency because it makes them anxious to have to make so many decisions. You know, it's sort of like standing in front of all the flavors at Baskin Robbins and feeling overwhelmed by the choices. Um, it's like what, what happens to Lydia, my Lydia, when we go to um, a restaurant that has so many gluten-free things on the menu. She's not used to that always. And she's like, oh my God, I want to eat this. I want to eat that. I want, this is too stressful. You know, it was easier when they had three things to choose from, right? Um, so <laughs> uh, letting people know they have a choice, inviting them into experiences and giving them options right so they're right there you have both you have the freedom to know that you have a choice you can make a choice but you're given specific things to choose from so it's like the difference between a multiple choice test and an essay question mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. right in, in in both cases you have to come up with something to put on that test but yeah. we all know that multiple choice is a lot easier than essay questions, you yeah. know? Um, and what if you were told that the test you're taking doesn't have a, a truly wrong answer? It's just a test to see if you're willing to give a, a response of some kind, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these sort of uh, ways we can think about what we're doing in the classroom. But the other big rule I find is once you're engaging someone in a, in a practice, or if you're cueing them to be engaged in a practice, it's really super important to give clear cues about what the technique is that you're teaching, but not to add into that 
what they should be feeling as a result. That's huge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and so and I think that that exactly speaks to the the person who has some trepidation or reluctance hmm. to to um yeah to to name what they're feeling because if the hmm. if if somebody names it for them and that and yeah. and that name is exactly hmm. the trigger that hmm. will send them sure. down their traumatic yeah. spiral sure. that's not safe yeah but we all we all have trauma around certain things we mm -hmm. all have issues that have arisen for us in our development regardless of how stressed it may have been you know um by factors that were not under our control and most of the factors that were present in our development were just not under our control you know and yet we always have the capacity to to choose courses of action for ourselves in the face of the things we didn't choose before we even knew that choice was a thing. Yeah. And, and, and that's really, that's, that's the formula of what makes a human being, you know, it's not nature versus nurture. And that's the end of the discussion. You know, it, that's a false a classic false alternative. It's actually nature and nurture versus free will versus volition versus agency. Um, and it's important to recognize that we were exercising our choices before we knew we were, before we knew mm -hmm. such a thing as choice existed, and before we had any sense of, of agency around the choices that were being made. Um, and that's how, on the one hand, to recognize that, yes, we were in situations perhaps when we were uh, developing traumatic situations that severely limited the degree of choice we had in a situation. And yet for someone that wasn't completely destroyed by their trauma, you can say that they made some good choices. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the best choice is to simply not be present, to, to literally disembody yourself, yeah. you know? to to have this this classic dissociative response to stress which is a good choice a survival you know, instinct to to not to not be fully present for this thing that could destroy you and and this is in yoga terms what we talk about when we, when we have this image of people who are living with their prana outside their physical bodies mm. this is from the teachings this is an old teaching it, it's not this is not a new idea um and it's part of the teachings that Krishnamacharya was, um, was communicating and thus to Desikachar and to us. It's like the first goal of a practice of yoga for someone is to get their prana gathered to within their physical body. Because without that, you can't have proprioception. You can't have interoception. You can't really respond adequately to a question like, what are you noticing? Mm -hmm. You know? Well, you can respond adequately, certainly. You can say, I don't know what I'm noticing. I'm noticing that I'm having trouble noticing. That's an yeah. important thing to recognize because then you're like, wow, where am I? You know, where am I in relation to, to this experience of, of being embodied? Am I slightly disembodied, right? And that's yeah. why confusion is, is to be so valued in the classroom and and that's what creates safety, I find, for people, is to know that, that recognizing their confusion is a really positive outcome. Yeah. Because you can't change something until you recognize, recognize that it's there. Uh, and that's why Jessica Chow was always saying the recognition of confusion is itself a form of clarity. So when you're teaching to that mindset, when, when, when I'm teaching, I'll speak from the first person, when I'm teaching with that in the front of my mind, like how would someone with trauma respond to this cue that I'm giving? That just makes it good teaching for everybody, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and because people, people who have that in their background 
you know, they don't necessarily want to be singled out in class as the person with trauma. That right. could be re-traumatizing, right? They just want to be taught to in a way that has the potential for working for them. And if I'm doing that, I'm, I'm teaching effectively for anybody. So trauma-sensitive teaching is just good teaching in my book. Yeah. It's about inviting people into experiences, giving them options, and not telling them what they should be feeling. To me, those are the, the cornerstones of, uh, of good teaching methodology. So speaking of trauma, we, we're all living through a collective trauma this year, on, you know, it's to varying degrees. And in, in this summer of I can't breathe, in all of its realms for a guy mm -hmm. who's built his brand um, and called it the breathing project. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about what, what this has meant for you? Well, on a very personal level, um, it's meant something pretty significant for me because I had my own exposure to, uh, to COVID very early on in this process. Uh, uh, getting ready to return to New York uh, from our month-long tour in um, in Australia. Uh, I was already starting to feel not that well in Sydney uh, at the last of our uh, weekend workshops, which is a pretty full workshop. We had like 70 people, you know, in a room without any thought that we needed to socially distance because, you know, no one had declared a pandemic at that point. And yet we know that there was COVID in Sydney at that point, you know. Um, because like Hank, you know, um, uh, 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 Tom Hanks famously admitted that, you know, he and his family in Sydney right then had been exposed and were quarantining. And so from, from Sydney, we, we flew to Hong Kong and because of all the flights getting rearranged, we, we had this different flight than we'd been planning on, which required a 16 or so hour layover in Hong Kong on our way back. So, you know, we were just like, we were socially distancing, quarantining ourselves as much as we could in this airport lounge and, you know, just like trying not to breathe on each other or other people and, you know, sanitizing everything. And, and you know, all of that notwithstanding on the flight home, to New York from Hong Kong, I was getting increasingly uh, like not well. And, you know, the only thing worse than coughing in public on an airplane, you know, during the initial outbreak of this COVID is trying to make yourself not cough. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be the typhoid Mary on the plane, right? Um, and by the way, I was not the only one that was not well on that plane, which was not full at all. The flights at that point were pretty empty. The one going over to, you know, in, in mid-February, going over to um, Australia through Hong Kong was like almost completely empty. So I had my own breathing challenges that I was uh, uh, dealing with. You know, I quarantined as soon as we got to this apartment I'm sitting in, and I didn't leave it for three weeks. And Lydia, who w was sleeping here on the couch, and I was in the bedroom over there, you know, we were living in the same space, but trying as best as we could not to interact with each other. She never got sick. And she's the one in the high risk category with her diabetes, right? right. So uh, I had trouble breathing. And the ironic thing that I noticed now that I think about it is I had kind of a higher standard for my own breathing than I think was, was really uh, useful at that time. That is ironic. Like I, no, seriously, I was, I, 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 I was uh, in a place where if I just took sort of quiet, you know, non-provoking a deeper pattern than I needed to in the moment breaths, I would be fine. I wouldn't get into a coughing fit. I wouldn't feel short of breath or whatever. Um, and it was when I sort of challenged myself to take what I recognized as a fuller, more complete breath that I got myself into trouble. Um, now, there's the flip side to that, because part of what I experienced personally as, these, as part of these symptoms 
aside from just the extreme fatigue that came with it, like having to nap for four hours after trying to vacuum the apartment kind of fatigue, you know. Um, on the other end of it, you know, part of, of how I practice and teach about is, is what happens when the breath gets really small, when it gets really quiet in these sort of very meditative, self-reflective states. And so I could let this minimize breathing that I, that I had to really do to not provoke the coughing go too far. And I found myself in these, these um, states of uncomfortable apnea, uncomfortable breath stoppage, where it felt like this, um, this uh, feeling of suffocation is what was provoking my next breath. And that was kind of troubling. Although it gave me a really, really far more uh, empathetic connection with so many of the people I've worked with over the years who kind of live on the edge of that state in their lives because of some breathing challenges they have. It's a really uh, sort of terrifying feeling, you know. And if I had that feeling and then the next breath I took couldn't get a feeling of adequate oxygenation into my body and, and, and the sort of panic that would have ensued, you know, in other words, if I didn't know how to free up my breathing in response to that, that sense of, of uh, not enough air and I felt restricted and then I started panicking and started working all of these muscles, that's a full-blown panic attack. That's a full-blown asthmatic episode. And, and so many of the people I've worked with, you know, live in that, in that state. So what techniques did you employ at that point? Techniques. It was more, I wouldn't, I would say that whatever techniques I had practiced up to my life at that point informed the choices I could make. Although I don't know if I would call those choices techniques in the moment. You know, techniques are for training. Mm -hmm. Techniques are for developing a certain wherewithal and facility with your system. Uh, but in the moment when you need to bring all of that into a choice about how to breathe, I don't know if that's a technique. You know, it's, it's sort of like with singers, right? Because I, I work a lot with singers um, who have some of the most disordered breathing you'll run across, uh, depending on their training, right? Because they learn so much technique in their voice training. Um, and yet, to be a really effective singer in a performance in the moment with your voice, with your breathing, with the, the words and the sounds that you're making, with the emotional expression and the connection, not just to yourself and the material that you're singing, but to the audience, there can't be technique there in that moment. Mm. If you're thinking of like, oh, how do I manipulate my breathing muscles so I can take the most effective inhale so that I can exhale strongly with this, with this phrase that I'm about to come out. If, you're, if that's where your brain is at, in the midst of a performance, you're so screwed. Yeah. You know? but, so... What you, but what you did in your training, what you learned about yourself in your training, what you freed up in your system, in your training, in your technique, in your voice lessons, in the scales that you've done, and all of that, that informs your ability to be present in that moment and be effective as a singer. So I'm not a singer, but I'm a breather, lifelong. Um, and I was experiencing uh, something that was really challenging my ability to breathe. And the wherewithal I had in those moments to, to not give in to panic, to not struggle, to not try to technique my way out of it, I, I think was definitely informed by my training and my technique. So it's an interesting question. So yes, technique influenced, what I was experiencing and, and choosing in those moments of breath challenge. But I wouldn't call what I did in those moments a technique, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. It's, so it's like the, the, all of the technique, all of the practice, all of the, all of the, um, the inquiry into the work mm. is now 
has been laid down in your being and then and then in in your moment of of relative crisis you yeah. just you just tapped into your deepest being maybe yeah well something like that and and you know look we call it practice for a reason what are you practicing yeah. for <laughs> you know i mean you have to be practicing for something and the something you're practicing for just can't be more practice because you'll never get to like the real thing that you've been practicing for. And what's that? That's like making moment to moment choices in your life that bring you, you know, out of suffering and into a state of less suffering or more integration. So, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes the practice pays off. And sometimes we're unable to let go of the practice and we try to technique our way through things that that actually are calling for us to let go of technique. Yeah. So we only have a couple more minutes, but I want to ask mm -hmm. you about the uh, about the the questions that we're facing now around mm -hmm. our societal and cultural trauma, and and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any insights into that. As a as a country, we can't breathe right now. It feels like that for mm -hmm. for so many people, and and uh, what as yogis, like the question of what, what have we been practicing for? For me, uh, in large part, I feel like I have been practicing for these times and being called upon to, to, to take stands and to, and to take action in ways that will relieve not just my own personal suffering, but the suffering of, of the people who, whom I, with whom I share life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I've been giving this a lot of thought, so I'm glad you're asking. And, you know, so, you know, we're taking the discussion in the realm of um, politics. Don't say it. Action. Oh, you said it. <laughs> Our, what? That, the word politics? That the dirty P word. word. P the P word. P yeah. word? No. It's not a dirty word. It's a branch of oh, philosophy. I, it's, you know? I absolutely believe. Um, I, my feeling is politics is the business of how we live together. Oh, you use the B word. No, Isn't that a dirty word too? Business. Oh, the, oh business. <laughs> yeah. Right. Look, if you've, if, you've, if you've studied as much philosophy as I have, you recognize politics as a branch of philosophy, but it's a branch that's further away from the roots of philosophy than some other branches. Because politics, and I'm using, I'm somewhat using Plato's formulation here, because he enumerated, at least in Western philosophy, the, the branches and the their order of significance. You know, because politics rests upon something called ethics. And ethics has to do with our own personal set of uh, values that inform us about what is the good for us and what goes against what is the good for us, right? And unless we have a, a strong sense of personal values and ethics, then action we take in the political realm um, is not really possible in a constructive way because politics is about, if you will, the ethics of how we relate our personal values to those of everyone else we find ourselves sharing the planet with, right? And by the way, politics isn't the final branch that, that um, uh, was enumerated by Plato. Uh, aesthetics actually was after that, right? Um, so aesthetics is, is how you, you take your value systems uh, and as they relate to other people and express it uh, in, in, in a stylized, idealized, artistic form of some kind. I, ha I have a friend who's a philosopher who is one of my teachers who actually has a branch beyond aesthetics, something that, that Plato didn't talk about. And for him, that's love, mm -hmm. which is for him a branch of philosophy, but which rests upon one's aesthetic sense of what you find attractive in another person, sure. politics, ethics. But what does ethics rest upon? Ethics rests upon epistemology. It rests upon how we, how we know what we know. 
and and having a good way of of grounding what we know in some kind of reality which goes back to how you opened this conversation because epistemology rests upon metaphysics and metaphysics isn't the way people commonly misuse the term it's not well what exists beyond this world in the mystical realm because i'm getting all metaphysical now metaphysics actually means you know what is real what is it we're dealing with in the universe and how can we how can we know it's real which is epistemology is inextricably intertwined with metaphysics you can't you can't consider a field like metaphysics without coming to some conclusions about how we know whether what what's real is real or not right so to get back to your 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 question um i think it's the same as as when we're learning asana at least the way i teach it there's a hierarchy of values that we need to consider when we're doing an asana and the formula i use is bas kag ram right you've probably heard this base of support first and foremost number 1 bos bas base of support it's the foundation of what you do in asana if you're standing it's your feet if you're sitting it's your ass you know if you're lying down it's your back in other words what body parts of yours are interacting with the supporting surface of the earth and what is the quality of that base of support and how much attention are you giving to it and that's quite literally like if you're building a house needing to pour the foundation first before you start decorating the windows and walls right and you can see people doing that in asana practice they're making it look good but it doesn't have an effective foundation and then kag so it's bas kag ram what's kag center of gravity how is my do first of all do i have a center of gravity do i have a single center of gravity where is it right a lot of people have trouble um actually integrating their different moving parts into a shape that has a single center of gravity and unless you can do that you can't relate it to your base of support so the second consideration is center of gravity but what you're doing to organize your center of gravity should never be at the expense of the quality of your base of support the third consideration then is range of motion rom bas kag ram right once i have a solid foundation and i've developed a center of gravity that can have a relationship with that foundation then i can start exploring ranges of motion of my spine my limbs my breath uh but in a way that doesn't compromise either my basis my my center of gravity or my base of support so the lessons we learn on the mat if they're contextualized well with a formula like i'm suggesting are absolutely a launching point for um an ethical values based understanding of who we are in the world and what kind of world we want to be living in and will then naturally if you're dedicated enough to those values lead to some sort of political action um i don't think that in the teachings of yoga as i understand them you'll find the answer to what sort of beliefs or actions you should have uh, beliefs you should have or actions you should take because everything is so open to interpretation even the bhagavad gita where there's a warrior yeah being exhorted by his friend his charioteer who happens to be the supreme lord okay exhorting him to take action in a war against his closest teachers and relatives okay this is your dharma this is your duty you must do it but krishna also says far better is it to do your own dharma poorly than someone else's dharma well the 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 big and message only, is you have to do yeah. something yeah but you have to know what your values are you have to know what your dharma is in order to do that um and that's something no one else can can tell you or give you you can't get it from a meme on facebook you can't get it from a uh, a news report regardless of which channel you watch um you can't get it from a political party um 
You can't get it from advertising. You have to know who you are and what sustains your life and uh, then take action. Yeah, thank you. Well said. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I've got a friend here who's been... <laughs> And he has a and he has a tennis ball that needs tossing. It's he has a dirty tennis yeah. ball. It's all over that. Well, that just means it's been it's been well loved. It's been well loved yeah. tennis ball. If you gave him a if you gave him a fresh one, he probably wouldn't want it. Yeah, right. Yeah, he it doesn't have his uh, his personal stank on it. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Great to talk to you as always. I'm so looking forward to this weekend. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to that and. Um, uh, let's, let's just get one of your fantastic groups together as you always do and just continue this conversation. We sure will. All right. All so right. good to see you. See you Take again soon. Care. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye.